Welcome back to another video in configuring Emacs. This is a series of videos I've been doing. This is going to be the seventh video in this series. For those of you that have not been following along, uh, if you go to my GitLab over at gitlab.com slash DWT1, that's my GitLab, I have a repository there called configuring Emacs. And in this repository, I'm going to have six, well, after this video, I'll have seven folders that when you click on them, you will get the configs as it existed at that point in the video series. So go over there and check that out after today's video to get the latest Emacs configs. And today's video is going to be a little different because now that we've spent so much time configuring Emacs, we're really getting to the point of it's kind of there, right? Today's video is more of we're going to wrap some things up. We're going to put a bow on it, right? Because <laughs> really, there's not very much I really need to tweak at this point. I've kind of got it working the way at least I want it to work. So let me switch over to my desktop and let me go ahead and launch my Emacs here. And remember, on the very first video, I set up a key binding to open my config.org space FC for find the config.org. So, and let me zoom in a little bit. Now, this config file, of course, has become rather lengthy in the course of seven videos. I'm not going to cover every single thing because most of this stuff I've covered in past videos. So, today I'm going to highlight some of the things I've added since that last video. So let me scroll down here because one of the things I changed, I added this on the previous video, but I had to make one small adjustment to it. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that all the automatic backups that Emacs creates, because Emacs has this annoying feature where it automatically creates backup files of everything you open in Emacs, and they all end in the tilde character, and you end up with all of these backed up files all over your file system because it just puts them in whatever directory that file you're editing already lives in. And I wanted all the backup files, any back, any file that Emacs decides to back up, I just want it to send it to the trash. And before I was sending this to uh, my home directory slash dot trash, which was a uh, directory that Emacs created for me, and it would just put them all in that. And then I decided, why not put it in the proper trash folder? So now I've set the location to be dot local slash share slash trash slash files, which is uh, the same directory that like your GUI file manager if you click on the trash can here in PC man FM you know if I scroll down let's see if I see any backed up files here yeah you see config.org because I open it all the time right and sometimes I edit it and you can see they end in the tilde character so these were automatic files backup files that Emacs created and when it created them it automatically sent them to this trash folder that way my Emacs directory, for example, isn't cluttered up with that config.org backup file. And if I keep scrolling down, uh, one other thing that I added was Lfeed. Now, this is not something that everybody will probably want to add to Emacs, but for me, I kind of like having an RSS newsfeed reader here inside Emacs because it kind of makes sense when you read RSS news feeds for the most part it's text now, there are images part of some of these feeds but that's fine Emacs is also a GUI program so it can display images just fine it just makes sense to have Emacs as your RSS reader so I have this block here where I use package L feed config and really the config part of it is just the links to the various RSS feeds and then I give it some descriptions. These are uh, tags that Lfeed can use. That way you can search among your feeds based on tags that you've assigned the feeds. So let me show you Lfeed in action. If I do a meta X and type Lfeed, and you can see I actually have already set a key binding for it, uh, space OE. So let's use that space O for open, E for Lfeed. That, that's how I thought of that particular key binding. And you can see, I've got this list of these various feeds. For example, if I want to read the Emacs subreddit, you know, I click on that particular post, right? I can read, if I want to, a J and K, right? We're using the evil motion keys, but if I do control J, uh, it will actually move me down by story, up and down. And you can see, I, I, instead of the cursor being in the preview, the cursor's actually the list of the RSS feeds. So that's kind of neat. And let me find one with an image just to verify that the images do work. So let me keep going down until I find here. Here's a, 
a news article that had an image in it. So images work just fine. Those, those might have been Reddit posts that had images. Uh, here's one from Elixir. And uh, to get out of this, to get out of L feed, Q to quit quits out of the split where we were previewing that story and Q again will actually just quit out of Elfie altogether and go back to the previous buffer which in my case is the config.org. Moving along in the config file I did make some changes here in the evil section of the config. If I scroll down this section right here is new. I'd actually had a post over on my GitLab somebody recommended me uh, this little bit of code so by default in Org mode here with the evil key bindings when you go to a link for example one of these links here in the table of contents these org mode links you know I was having to click on it to go to it so if I clicked on all the icons for example that's how I would have to go to it because just simply hitting enter on the link did not work at least it did not work until I added this block of code here and the reason it didn't work is because of course evil mode it's kind of like the vim mode you're in insert no mode normal mode and all of that the return key just doesn't work as expected when you're using evil mode so what you have to do is with a val after load evil maps so you know the, the evil key maps i want you to redefine some of what the, these keys typically do so basically we're saying space turn it off, return, turn it off, tab, turn it off in evil mode. And that way they act the way they would act not in evil mode. You know, like if you were using the standard Emacs key bindings. Because if you were using the standard Emacs key bindings, return actually does follow org mode links. So that's how we accomplish that, uh, that little bit of magic <laughs> that needed to happen. So, you know, there's always these little quirks when you're using evil mode. You know, there are some things that are kind of unexpected that you do have to find workarounds for. Now let's talk about some of the new programs that I've added to the config. So I've got this section right here, get programs. So for those of you that use Git, right? So you're constantly pushing and pulling from your GitLab or your GitHub or whatever, then you might find these programs kind of useful. First, I'm installing the Git Time Machine. So that's a program that allows you to move backwards and forwards through a file's commits. So the commit history. And this is a really cool little program that you can add to Emacs. So let me show you Git Time Machine in action. So let me do a vertical split and let me navigate to an actual Git repo on my system. So let me go into my GitLab repos folder where I've got a bunch of GitLab repos, obviously, including the configuring Emacs repo. And of course, to see commit history, you actually need to be on a file. So for example, how about the readme.org here? So let me go ahead and open that up and then let me do meta x and get time machine which i have binded you can see i've binded it to space gt for space get time machine so let's use that right space gt and you can see down here in the mini buffer adding link to readme so that was the last one if i do control k for up you know or going up through the history so a previous um, commit you can see adding readme.org was also the commit message for that adding video 3 to the readme adding video 2 and you can see the, re the readme actually changes as I do that right so that's kind of cool right that, that's a, a just a, an amazing program to add to your Emacs. And another Git program I added was Maggot. So I did a simple use package, Maggot. Maggot is the full featured Git client for Emacs. Now, me personally, I, I'm not a Maggot user because some of my repositories are Git bare repos that Maggot doesn't handle that well, but it's available for you if you want it because it's obviously it's in my config. So if I do a vertical split and let's navigate once again to a repository. So we'll go to something that I know probably has something in it that I could go ahead and do a commit on my DM scripts repository here, right? And if I do a search for maggot here, maggot dash status is what we're looking for. And you can see I've got uh, this file here and it's staged changes. If I hit U to unstage it, you know, so now it's unstaged now, S to stage it. And if I want to go ahead and push it, I believe I could do P on the keyboard. And then where do we want to push it to? We want to push it to the origin master. And of course, I did all that without entering a commit message. So that's my bad. So let me type C for commit 
and then C again for commit, and then type a commit message. I don't even know what I did in this file. Um, so I'm just going to say, not sure what I did. <laughs> I have no idea. I know it's a horrible commit message, but hey, whatever. For the purposes of this video, we're just going to leave that as is. And I believe if I do uh, control C, control C, so twice, then I get back to this and you can see it's unmerged into origin master. And now if I do P to push and then U for origin master, and now it's gone. And you can see there's no more stage changes or unstage changes. So I just successfully push that to my GitLab. So let me do space BP for buffer previous, space WW to change the cursor to the other split there, and then space WC for window close to close the split. And you can see uh, a new program I also added was the highlight to do program. So I really kind of missed some of the uh, to do kind of words being highlighted. This is something that Doom Emacs uh, does out of the box, and I kind of missed that. So I went ahead and did a use package HL to do, right? So highlight to do, and then in the config portion of it, we can set different to do type words. I'm going to use to do, fix me, hack, review, note, and deprecated, and I give it the style as far as what color to use, the warning color, the error color, the font lock constant color, and then whether I want it bold or italicized or whatever it happens to be. So this is a very nice program to have, especially if you're one of those people that actually do make a lot of to-do lists and you include words like to-do or node or done or whatever it happens to be. Having those particular keywords stand out because they're a different color really does help a lot. Under the language support section, I before the previous video, I really only had two languages I needed to add. I added uh, Haskell mode and Lua mode because a lot of the other stuff like Python and bash scripting and things like that already has built-in support with Emacs, but I found one the other day that is not uh, built-in supported by Emacs. That's PHP because I was uh, having to edit some PHP files, right? So I went ahead and did a use package PHP mode. That way I have syntax highlighting in those PHP documents. One minor gripe I was having with Emacs was the fact that anytime you're in the mini buffer, by default Emacs requires you to hit escape three times to get out of the mini buffer, right? Well, I wanted a single escape to work. I think that's what most users probably expect the default behavior to be. So what I did is we did a global set key escape, keyboard escape quit. So this is a function and we're binding that to a single press of escape. So now when I'm in the mini buffer, hitting escape one time gets me out. Some other things that I have added include, well, let me get past the org mode section, perspective. So perspective is basically a way to have multiple workspaces within Emacs. So think of like a tiling window manager, like I'm in Qtile, right? And I have workspace one through nine. Well, you can actually do that inside Emacs. You can assign workspaces, give them their own names, and you can have groups of buffers within each of these perspectives or these workspaces. And what I did is I binded space equals to the perspective mode map. So it lists all the perspective related bindings in this one map, right? So I didn't have to bind each one of these individually. That's just a built-in thing with perspective. You can just assign that key to give you this entire menu. And you can see zero through nine switches from, basically you can think of it perspective one through 10. So, or workspace one through 10. So if I do a uh, super equals and then one, that would switch me to perspective one, which we're already in. I don't have a second perspective, but I could create one if I do space equals to get this back. I could do S for perspective switch and let's give it a name because right now we just have the one perspective that defaults to the name main but maybe I want a new perspective and we just created a new perspective a new workspace that defaults to of course the scratch buffer which is kind of the default buffer if anytime you create a new uh, Emacs frame and if I want to let's just navigate to something how about my dot bash RC file that way we have some buffers going on in this perspective which would be the second perspective now let me do space equals and now switch to one so i go back to that particular perspective space equals two goes back to that new perspective i created and again each one of them are going to have buffers open 
on their own particular perspectives. And it's really, a, if you're one of those people that ends up having dozens or even hundreds of buffers open, sometimes that's a nice way to organize these things. If I do space BI to open up iBuffer, I have configured iBuffer to actually show me uh, all the buffers that are open. Because by default, iBuffer will only show you the buffers in your current perspective, but I have added some code to uh, have every uh, perspective and all the buffers listed. And you can see the new perspective and its two buffers, the scratch buffer and the bash RC, and the main perspective with all of those buffers that I had opened up previously in it. So that is perspective. Let me do a space FC to get back to the config file here. Now let me scroll down. One other thing I wanted to add in previous videos, I added rainbow mode. Rainbow mode is really nice because it gives you a color, a background color for a hex value. For example, uh, six Fs here, F, 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 that's a white, right? That's a completely white background. And that's really nice, but there's also another really popular rainbow package that I believe is also enabled by default on Doom Emacs, and I really missed it, and that's the rainbow delimiters. So, and I misspelled delimiters there. Let me correct that before I push this to my GitLab. Actually, should have been capitalized. So one of the problems, especially when you're coding in something like Emacs Lisp, but other languages as well, is opening parentheses and closing parentheses. How do you know if you've got the right number? Well, here's the thing. If they're all color coded, for example, this green opening parentheses and this closing green parentheses, you can tell they belong to the same pair, right? And then the next two are green. And then that one's purple because that's the closing parentheses for this one, which was purple, right? So it's a really nice thing. And this delimiter thing is not just for parentheses. It works with brackets and braces. Moving on, I created a new section here called sane defaults because I had a lot of really small code blocks that were really just one setting for one particular program. And I didn't need all of these to be in their own little sections of this literate config. So I created sane defaults. So these are like one line kind of things. And these are things that I believe should just be defaults in Emacs for pretty much everybody. So it makes sense why I label this section sane defaults. So that includes things like the delete section mode. So you can see, you can select text and delete it by typing. So for example, if I'm in insert mode, let me hit I on the keyboard to get into insert mode. And I select this text. Now I start typing, you know, it deletes that text I had highlighted which is kind of a default behavior in pretty much every text editor, but that's not the default behavior in Emacs. In Emacs, by default, that actually doesn't work. You just start typing and whatever you have highlighted still stays there, right? So uh, delete selection mode to one for true, and then electric indent modes turned off. So that's the weird indenting, which I covered on a previous video. Most of these like turning off the menu bar, scroll bar, the toolbar, you know, so it's basically just a, a plain window with no toolbars, no fancy uh, side uh, scroll bars or anything like that. Now, two things I want to quickly highlight is I turned on electric pair mode. So electric pair mode is when you type a parentheses and opening parentheses, it automatically creates the closing one for you. For example, I just type a opening parentheses. You see, I get the closing one automatically or opening double quotes. I get that automatically. And that really does save on typing because you never have to worry about that closing character. It's already taken care of it for you. So I always want to have electric pair mode turned on. You can see it's set to one, one is on, negative one would be off. But there is one serious problem with electric pair mode, and that is inside org mode when you're creating source code blocks, which you're going to do all the time. So to create a source code block, how do you typically do that? You do a less than sign S and then tab complete, right? Well, here's the problem. If you turn on the electric pair mode, right? You're going to do that opening less than sign, and it's automatically going to create the closing greater than sign, the closing tag, the, the closing chevron, right? And But then you're going to type S and tab complete, and it's going to work because, you know, that less than S tab works, but then you forget it also tagged on that. So when I first turned on electric pair mode here inside my Emacs config, all of a sudden, everything was breaking. My config was breaking. Any kind of literate configs that I wrote in org mode were breaking. It's because I was creating all these source code blocks and I didn't realize every single one of them, it was tacking that greater than sign on. So 
I needed to find a way around that. And that is where this particular line here, this add hook, you can see we're going to do an add hook on the org mode hook. So org mode documents, because that's the only place where we're going to need this to happen and set queue local so we're assigning a value to a particular variable the variables electric dash pair dash inhibit dash predicate so basically we're telling electric pair mode to not use a certain character so prevent this particular character from being a part of electric pair mode is essentially what's happening and that is going to be the less than symbol right because that's what you open the source code block with every time i type a less than symbol now electric pair mode ignores adding that greater than sign at the end. So that's how we accomplish that magic. And one other program, it's a really simple program, but I wanted it added to my config just because I find it extremely useful. I use it all the time in the terminal. And I also wanted it available here inside Emacs, and that is the TLDR program. Too long, didn't read, right? So TLDR is essentially like a really short form man page it's essentially it gives you like 10 of the most common commands for a particular program so if i do meta x tldr and you can see i've binded that to space st and space s key bindings i think i'm thinking of like search so space search tldr and i hit enter and now let's view the tldr page for a particular program for example the ls program there is the tldr for ls you can see some of the common ways to use ls some of the common flags and options and the really cool thing about the emacs version of tldr of course you get some nice highlighting so it actually kind of stands out you know the command is highlighted in this case green and then the options are highlighted in kind of a lighter gray color compared to the background so that is visually it really kind of stands out and one final thing i want to mention here as i'm tidying up we're really just putting the finishing touches really on this emacs config because it's pretty much done at this point going back to my general key binding section i have a ton of key bindings right and i'm not going to sit here and describe all the bindings but now I just scroll down. Got a lot of key bindings, right? <laughs> Lots of key bindings. So at this point, I feel pretty good about what this has become. I, I This is actually pretty close to what I had when I was a Doom Emacs user. So essentially, I've recreated using a standard GNU Emacs. And then I slowly configured this thing myself to be what what I had back in Doom Emacs. So I'm gonna go ahead and push this latest config file over to my GitLab. So look for the configuring Emacs repo over on my GitLab. Uh, I will have that posted when I post this video on YouTube. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. And of course, I'm talking about Daniel, Gabe, James, Matt, Paul, Royal West, Armor Dragon, Commander Angry, George Lee, Methos, Nate, Erjan, Paul, Peace Arch and Fedora, Reality, Teats for Lust, Red Prophet, Roland, Soul Sastry, Tools, Devler, War Gen 2, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon without these guys. Episode 7 of Configuring Emacs would not have been possible. The show is brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon. I don't have any corporate sponsors. Corporate sponsors don't sponsor Emacs videos, right? I depend on you guys. So if you like my work and want to see more videos about free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.